The topic under discussion today is health and safety law and enforcement with a subhead in posing the question, is it fit for the 21st century? Looking back over the last year and our experience of how COVID pandemic was handled, particularly in the workplace, the answer to that question would have to be a resounding no. Whether we talk about the law or whether we talk about enforcement, the system, the structures and the institutions have failed to protect working people and have clearly fallen far short of expectations. For those of you who follow the work of the Institute, you will know that we recently launched a new publication called Health and Safety and COVID at Work, a case of regulatory failure. This report was kindly drafted with the assistance of 11 health and safety specialists, some of whom are here with us today. They'll talk us through the chapters they contributed and explain why they believe the UK's laws and regulatory mechanisms have failed. And the evidence of that failure is all around us. Just yesterday, the TUC issued the findings of a survey of over 2,000 safety representatives, and the TUC's findings reflect those in our own report, which identified failure of employers on PPE, on risk assessment, and on social distancing, failure by the HSE to carry out inspections, with 22% of the safety reps in the TUC survey saying they had never been visited by a health and safety inspector. These failures of both employers and the HSE led to workplaces being significant locations for the transmissions of the virus, with the TUC reporting that 83% of respondents said employees had tested positive, and 57% saying their workplaces had seen a significant number of COVID cases. Little wonder then that the UK has one of the worst death rates in the world, which is why the first recommendation of the 10 list in the IER's report is a need for uh, uh, an inquiry, a committee of inquiry to examine the changes needed to improve our health and safety laws. We're unlikely to get that from a present government, which is why IER will be conducting its own inquiry in the year ahead. Next year is the 50th anniversary of the Robins Inquiry, the outcome of which was the Health and Safety at Work Act, the legislation that still forms the basis of health and safety laws in the UK. To coincide with that anniversary, IER, together with Hazards, will be publishing our own report on the changes we think are needed to ensure our health and safety laws are fit for the 21st century. And we are also hoping that our calls for change will be strengthened by similar demands at the international level. Last week, the governing body of the ILO agreed to push on with its plans to call for occupational health and safety to be designated as a fundamental right at work. Such a move would place health and safety at work on a par with prohibition of child and forced labour, discrimination at work, the right to join a union bargain collectively and to take strike action. Prevention of workplace illness was one of the ILO's founding objectives in 1919. It would be very fitting then if the ILO conference in June this year reflected the importance of occupational health and safety as the world takes its first steps out of the COVID imposed lockdown. So on to our speakers for today and what an excellent platform of speakers we have. Our first speaker today is going to be Professor Phil Taylor. Phil is Professor of Work and Employment Studies in the Department of Human Resource Management at Strathclyde Business School. His research into call centres and offshoring continues to have a significant impact and Phil's survey helped inform IER's own report. His articles and edited journals have won awards, are often cited in academic journals and attract, I have to say, great interest in the media, helping him to get the message out to a wider audience. Apart from health and safety issues, Phil also writes on a range of work issues. Between 2008 and 11, he co-edited Work, Employment and Society, 
Um, and since 2012, he's been the editor of another multidisciplinary journal, New Technology, Work and Employment. Phil is going to set the scene for us here today. So welcome to Phil. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Can you all hear me out there? This is good. Um, I want to apologise in the first instance here because I haven't got a formal presentation as such, but I've got plenty of material that can be circulated, including uh, a seminar on a similar topic that I did last week for the students at Strathclyde. So that, that kind of addresses the things I'll be talking about. I want to start really by going back a year or slightly more than a year. I mean, I took the opportunity recently to have a look at what the World Health Organization said on the 11th of March when they declared uh, COVID-19 a pandemic. And they said, quite rightly, that pandemic was not a word to be used lightly, indeed so, or carelessly. They then went on to say, if countries detect, test, treat, trace, isolate, and mobilize the people in the response, those with a handful of cases can prevent those cases becoming clusters, and those clusters becoming community transmission. Now, with hindsight, of course, this just appears like complacent optimism, but it's not merely a matter of hindsight because there were a good many of us at the time who knew precisely what the dangers that were emerging from SARS-CoV-2's transmission were. And of course, co countries did not do this with one or two exceptions, New Zealand um, being notable and other countries, Thailand, Vietnam, and so on. And the outcomes of course have been catastrophic. Um, it's very difficult to look back in the past year without a profound sadness and I think a, a, a sort of quiet rage that all of us kind of bubbles up when we realise that so much of what has happened has been kind of unnecessary and unavoidable. And a year ago, we were going through the period where the Prime Minister of Britain um, had just missed five COVID meetings, COBRA meetings, because he was celebrating uh, celebrating Brexit. This is when he was the shake hands man. This is when the government was flirting with eugenics and the herd immunity strategy. Um, this is the government that then has managed to squander 37 billion pounds in the, the lucre given to the chums in this new chumocracy and so on. And when we look at unprecedented, this what unprecedented, this is an unprecedented situation. This is unprecedented. We are not, well, actually, it's not entirely unprecedented, is it? Because in the recent, since 2000, we've had, we've had SARS, we've had MERS, we've had Ebola, we've had a number of zoonotic pathogens that give us, or should have given us, far greater insight into what the catastrophe could, could you know, could have been. And of course, then there's the Spanish flu epidemic of 1918. Can we learn from it? Absolutely. An article published in the American Journal of Epidemiology in 2018 by Jesta and colleagues said, governments and healthcare systems remain inadequately prepared for the impact of a 1918-like severe influenza um, epidemic. And we know the consequences here. We are, I checked the figures today, 388 million uh, COVID cases globally, 2.8 million deaths across the world. And as Cad said in an introduction, here we have the UK, the shining light of, uh, what was it, moonshot excellence, 190.76 cases uh, mortality of 100,000 po population. And whatever the strain, and this is the worry, isn't it, that the strain will continue to mutate and come back. Johnson now is playing an unbelievably um, risky and dangerous nationalism by somehow imagining that this third wave that will come from Europe, as he says, will wash over us, this kind of European wave. In fact, what, it, what we're going to be getting, actually, is the Kent wave re-imported. So it was a good old British variant that went over to Europe and it is now coming back to us as well. So, uh, briefly on the origins of COVID, because I think it's important to set this into some kind of broader context. Um, COVID, or rather SARS-CoV-2, originated on the frontiers of capitalist agriculture or agribusiness, with the deforestation of, uh, if you like, hinterlands. And 
what SARS-CoV-2 is, is a zoonotic, as I mentioned, a zoonotic pathogen. In other words, it comes from the animal kingdom to, 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 to humans. Without going into the detail of this, I would recommend that you read Rob Wallace's excellent articles on how um, the how it transferred from, from, from animals to humans, the mechanisms, although the precise and exact mechanism by which it came from bats to people is not exactly known, but certainly lies through the food and the global production networks in, a, in China. What is absolutely the case, of course, is that the pathogen transmitted um, through global production and travel networks um, within with you know within days so in that sense you know we cannot see this as an animal made um virus for a whole number of reasons but it's human made and the emphasis must be on humans and it must be put on the ways in which the the virus is circulated because it's embedded within the circuits of capital and then of course we have to understand its combined uneven and uneven dispersion now this is where it's contingent upon multiple interrelated factors at the national level, at regional level, at local level, community level, and even street, even street level. And briefly, if we consider some of these factors, we can get some sense of how the workplace is embedded within them. Population and residential de density, ethnicity, the impact on ethnic populations in the UK, where the Bangladeshis or Afro-Caribbean has been far more significant, that COVID has exposed the pre-existing and continued income and wealth inequalities that exist in society, exacerbated by COVID. Um, global health policy, obviously, is a factor. The WHO, right, which in one significant respect I will, I will, I will uh, put forward, has been profoundly flawed in its, 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 its approach. The national government policy, I don't need to go into this. We know the failings of our own government, or Bolsonaro in, uh, in Brazil, or the Detelman uh, in, you know, you know, in America. I wish he'd taken that step, actually, and, and consumed what he was preaching, nevertheless. And then, of course, the question of public health resources and intervention so important. The understanding that we put across in this pamphlet that COVID is about the fusion of public and occupational health. They are intertwined in all so many ways. And then, of course, what others will be speaking about today, the OHS networks, the frameworks, the regulation, and of course, the employment relations networks within this. And a phrase we were talking before about the meeting, how absolutely serious is the significant, not serious depiction by the uh, HSE and by MIMS in the government. And this takes us now, doesn't it, to work and employment. Because within this matrix of viral transmission, mediation and prevention, the domains of work and employment are also important. The ONS in January said, concluded, and a lot of the ONS statistics have been quite confusing and obfuscatory over the past period, but nevertheless, 3,549 workplace outbreaks in the period since, I think it is July to December, or maybe, maybe, maybe a little bit later. And we say to ourselves, why is it the workplaces are important when it comes to SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19? Well, workplaces are the assemblages, the coming together of potentially vulnerable bodies in collectivities. I say collectivities, for the most part, that is true of many workplaces, not true of all workplaces, is it? Because if you look at security guards or bus drivers, they are individual often in their workplace, their transient workplaces, but nevertheless interact with, with people in their customer facing and servicing roles. But you get the point that I'm making here, don't you? That these the workplaces being very much the epicenters of transmission and workers in those situations being incredibly vulnerable. Nowhere so is this more the case that with the with the, the, the hospital workers, healthcare workers themselves, the BMJ calculates the 850 healthcare workers died between March and December 
of last year. The figure is 3,000 in the United States. The long toll of physical and mental health that's, that, that, uh, that has accompanied that, of course, is incalculable. And you know, the BMJ talks about this, the new abnormal, right? Of healthcare workers being thrust yet again, and you know, you can ex overextend First World War trench metaphors here, but nevertheless, thrust into a front line, ill-prepared, ill-equipped, with poor PPE, if non-existent, where courageous health workers continually went into the front line before the lockdown in order to um, in order to save people's lives and so on, exposing themselves to tremendous risk. And, you know, one thing that I'm thinking of for Workers' Memorial Day this year is to read out some of the names of these people. So if we have Charles Tanor, Adil El Tayar, Habid Zaidi, Pooja Sharma, Amagad El Harawani. These were five of the first hospital workers who died um, uh, way back in March and April of last year. Unnecessary death, we have to keep telling ourselves. A similar story is true of the care homes and care home workers, not least the quasi-genocide that took place of those poor old people in, 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 you know, in care homes. Um, and what care homes did, of course, was expose another fundamental flaw line in the British regulatory regime, the arrival of a workfare regime where Care workers found it impossible, were unwilling to take a COVID test. Why? Because if they were found to be positive, they would be then thrust onto 95 pound statutory sick pay that could not keep themselves and their families alive. You know, these, these profound inequalities. We look at transport workers, for example, and that London bus drivers are three times more likely that to die than the national average for other occupations. 51 in London, according to a study that Sir Michael Marmot has recently concluded. And many of these happening because lockdown was so delayed, so, so, so clumsily in implemented. Supermarket workers. One study of supermarket workers has shown that, uh, and this is where it was an experiment where mandatory testing took place, that 20% of them had um, were, 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 were asymptomatic, right? And, you know, the, 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 again, another BGM, BMJ report. In the meatpacking industry, 30,000 cases in the US, 440 food outbreaks in the UK. In Gütersloh in Germany, um, 1,500 out of 7,000 workers were, were, were posed, were, were, you know, were, were positive, leading to a workplace, sorry, a community shutdown of 600,000 people. Again, and that evidence that the workplace, rather than being the pass passive somehow recipient of community transmission, can be the generator, the epicenter, the hub of community transmission. Um, prisons, we don't know. We're still trying to find out. I know, because this is the part of the world that I come from, the biggest outbreak in Ayrshire in recent years, in, in recent times, community transmission, it appears like, in fact, what it is, is it's, it's stemming from the Kilmarnock private prison. The garment industry in Leicester, women's sewing machinists have the highest fat fat fatality rate of any female occupation, four times as likely as to die from COVID-19 than other women workers. Some of the statistical breakdown by occupation can be seen in the ONS report of the 25th of January, but quite often, as I said before, it obscures more than it reveals in terms of causation, trends, and so on. A very important piece of work was done, which I think probably CAD uh, came after we'd submitted the manuscript here, but it was very, very useful by Tom Wall, the Observer, Guardian, and BBC journalist, who did a public health a PHE request and found the Eventually, eventually, why do we have to make these FOI requests in order to get this information, for goodness sake? That should be publicly available so we can act upon it and understand. Anyway, more than 500 outbreaks in the second half of 2020 amongst office workers, more than supermarkets, construction, warehouse, cafe, restaurants combined. And none of these, as we know, are safe situations. Touch briefly in construction sites. Surely they're outside. Surely these are safe. No, they're not. 
workers working gangplanks come close to each other, th you know, throughout the course of the working day, the wee bothies where they have a cup of tea, you name it, these are interactive environments as well. 687 outbreak, office outbreaks between April and February. The DVLA, have I got, what, a few minutes, Cad? How many? Two minutes. The, D the DVLA in Swansea people know about, appalling. 2,000 workers still working there, despite the fact that, you know, the single worst out workplace outbreak in the UK. And then there was my, my call on call centre work. And I briefly kind of want to kind of finish on this because this is this is really important. The the modes of transmission of of SARS are important to us. The direct contact with infected the four routes: the direct contact with infected persons that fall in contaminated surfaces, and so on. Secondly, larger small virus droplets, respiratory droplets. We kind of know this, but third and crucially airborne aerosol transmission through tinier particles uh, has been demonstrated to be the most kind of voracious and infectious route of transmission. We would not neglect either the fourth route, which is the oral um, fecal route, which is important when it comes to questions of toilet cleanliness and so on. Now, the received wisdom has been and remains that the two most important routes are um, the large droplets of contact uh, and so on. And therefore the social distancing protocols and the washing and cleaning etiquette has become, um, has become, has been made paramount, you know, wash your hands, sing happy birthday or the Internationale or whatever you do, or the Easter Spades by Motorhead, which is what I do when, when you're washing your hands. But these are necessary, but absolutely insufficient because much of what we are have led to believe is based upon an outdated, incorrect epidemiology where the two meters social distance in the washing and cleaning are necessary but inadequate, given that these aerosol sprays can travel tens of meters inside in indoor environments. These are amplified and exacerbated by heating and ventilation systems. I commend to you the work that Hilda and Hazards has done on air quality. It's extremely important. And here you have the Definitive statement made by Maraska and Milton, the leading global epidemiologists who marshaled 241 scientists to lobby the World Health Organization for them to take seriously, as they had not done so, the question of airborne internal transmission. And in the call center and in office environments where you have compromised social distancing, recirculating air, inadequate uh, ventilation systems and so on, combined with an employer and government policy of trying to maintain business as usual as much as possible, which has led us to petri dishes of contamination, where workers report the heating and ventilation system mean that contagious particle spread like wildfire. This has been true for decades in the course of COVID. It is appalling. So to conclude, we have the profit maximizing cost reduction business strategies that dominate organizational behavior and against this or within this we have the failure of a regulatory system that other people will, will talk about to talk about again today significant not serious well i'd hate to see what serious actually is in this context and it's against this of course the health and safety reps trade unions and workers in the workplace and the, the, the hazard network and all of us occupational health and safety campaigners are trying to reverse this completely asymmetrical and incorrect and totally fallible regime of so-called regulation of occupational health and safety. Thank you very much for that uh, scene, Sessa. Phil, that was uh, brilliant, full of stats, full of um, facts and full of political analysis um, and emotion, of course, as ever. So that was great. It's great to receive and circulate the presentation that you spoke of and the additional uh, links to further reading. I'm sure people would appreciate who are here today. 
you mentioned that occupational health is intertwined with public health um, and gave living examples of how that played out in, uh, in real life in various sectors of our economy. Our next speakers will highlight how health and safety law and protections can be undermined and intertwined by our general framework of labour law. So for our next presentation, we have not one but two barristers, two QCs, who specialise in labour law. Uh, between them, they're going to talk through various aspects of health and safety law and regulation. So we have Professor Michael Ford QC, who is a barrister at Earl Square Chambers and a professor at the University of Bristol. He specialises in labour law. He was formerly the editor with John of Redgrave's Health and Safety and Monkman's Employer Liability, the two leading texts on health and safety at work. And we have John Hendy, who is chair of the Institute, president of the International Centre for Trade Union Rights, vice president of the Campaign for Trade Union Freedom. He's also an honorary professor of law at University College London. He's advised various politicians from Laura Pridcock through to the um, current shadow um, Minister for Employment Rights and Protections, Andy MacDonald. He speaks on workplace rights in the House of Lords, uh, where he was appointed in 2019. He's a frequent writer and speaker. He um, was one of the editors of the Manifesto for Labour Law and rolling out the Manifesto of Labour Law, a couple of IER um, reports. He often writes on labour law and co-authors with Professor Keith Ewing, who is president of the Institute. So uh, these are taking my job because I no longer have to chair between these two. They will go in conversation themselves. So over to you. Well, thanks very much for the introduction, uh, Phil and uh, uh, Cad, and thanks very much for the uh, contribution from uh, Phil just, just now. Um, you, you reminded us that uh, uh, Michael and I edited the leading textbooks on uh, injuries at work, uh, Monkman's Employer's Liability and Redgrave's Health and Safety at Work. I think we started that, that about 25 years ago, or nearly 25 years ago. Um, Michael continued a bit longer than, than I did, but neither of us are, are currently the editors of those because we've we've fo over the years we've focused on uh, more industrial relations aspects of the, of the law of, at work and not on so much on health and safety at work i don't think either of us uh, really thought that we'd come back to focus at all on health and safety at work although of course it's an integral part of labor law the law of the workplace but what happened with uh, COVID-19 and the, the uh, pandemic um, is uh, really uh, took our breath away uh, as labour lawyers because we realised that um, a whole uh, tranche of legislation, I think there's been about 150 pieces, separate pieces of legislation relating to uh, COVID-19 over the last year or so uh, ha have been passed, but very little of it actually deals with uh, the workplace. And uh, as uh, Phil uh, said a, a few minutes ago, workplaces are the epicenters of transmission of COVID-19. So it, it's, it's perhaps a little surprising that so little of that the COVID legislation relates to workplaces. Uh, of course, there is legislation requiring uh, face coverings on public transport and in other places where uh, people work in clinical settings and in a, a, um, pubs and restaurants and so forth when they're open. But in one sense, uh, what was striking to us was that there wasn't really that much need for particular legislation dealing with COVID-19 and the workplace for the simple reason that there is a huge wealth of legislation already in existence, which had been in existence for decades before 2020, 
uh, which applied and should have protected uh, workers. And we have, as we now know, and as Phil has so eloquently described, have failed to protect workers over the course of, of this, uh, pan, uh, this pandemic. In, in a moment, Michael and I will try and describe what the existing law was uh, as it applies to COVID-19. But I just want to, uh, uh, before uh, Michael kicks off with that, I just want to point out that what we found particularly striking was the guidance given by government to employers and to workplaces. On the 11th of May last year, the government produced a suite of guidances for different kinds of uh, workplace. And I've just looked this morning to see uh, the latest update, which is the 26th of March. That's only four days ago that this guidance has been updated. And what's striking about that guidance is that it makes practically no mention at all of the existing statutory uh, and common law duties on employers to make workplaces safe and to keep workers safe whilst they're uh, at work. Um, and, and that's in a whole number of respects where you'd ex expect specific a, a reference to uh, existing laws. Now, I won't detain Michael much longer. But I just say, give you one example, and that's in relation to risk assessments. In a moment, my, Michael will, will, will describe the legislation that requires risk assessments to be conducted by employers at workplaces. Now, it's true that the guidance says that risk assessments should be conducted, but it doesn't say that it's actually a, a criminal offence not to conduct a risk assessment where one is required by the existing uh, regulation. And the one thing that, that the guidance, such as it is, it's uh, very slight on conducting a risk assessment. The one thing that it doesn't do is make the point that Phil made a few minutes ago, that the main source of transmission of COVID-19 infection is by uh, aerosol. That, that's to say the tiny, tiny droplets in the air, which are transmissible far wider than two meters, particularly in enclosed spaces. And the antidote to this, obviously, is proper ventilation. There is legislation about uh, ventilation, but what the guidance doesn't do is to advise the office manager or the school governors, how they are to assess whether there is sufficient ventilation in the office or in the classroom to sufficiently protect those who are working or present in those uh, uh, places. You have to measure the cubic liters of fresh air per person per minute. Now, I ask you, how, how can an office manager throw open a window or a teacher th throw the windows open and calculate just how many litres of fresh air are likely to come in for the number of people who are in that uh, room at any particular time? It can't be done. And uh, uh, one would have expected really intricate uh, guidance given in order to conduct sufficient risk, risk assessment. So I've, I've uh, um, spoken too long and over to Michael to describe the statutory law. Thank you, John. <clears throat> I think we wrote most of Monkman on your barge, as I remember, which must be one of the most inadequately uh, ventilated workplaces I've ever had the misfortune to work on. But anyway, that was a long time ago. Um, yeah, well, we've, we've in, in theory, we've got a lot to cover. I think I'm going to say something about the general statutory framework. Then John's going to talk about the common law. And then I'll say a bit about section 4400, rights to leave the workplace. And then John will say a little bit about the uh, guidance at the end. But, you know, time is very short. So, I mean, I suppose if there's two broad themes that emerge from this, so far as I'm concerned, it's first, there is a pretty extensive statutory framework. 
Um, but the problem is always enforcement. It's a recurrent theme in labor law these days. Lots of rights on the statute book that turn out to be paper tigers. And the second theme is that where you have rights to leave the workplace and the like, they tend to be focused, uh, or, or even personal injury claims, they tend to be focused on the individual. The, the, the existing system prioritizes individual rights and enforcement over collective mechanisms. And you see that most, most clearly in relation to the rights to leave the workplace, which intersect very awkwardly with strike laws, because if the, um, if the union tells members to leave the workplace, that will be industrial action, it will need to be balloted and it won't be protected under the, um, it, the union itself will have no protection and individuals are left to decide whether or not circumstances of dangerous, serious and imminent and they may have individual rights. So those are really just the two broad themes. Um, against that background, what to say about the existing statutory framework? Well, as John says, um, the government publications have neglected it. On the face of it, it's pretty impressive. Um, the legislation all goes back to the Early East Factories Act, but we have the Health and Safety at Work Act laying down extensive and wide duties that employers own to ensure the health, safety and welfare, not only of their employees, section two, but also others who may be affected by the conduct of their undertaking. And then you have more detailed regulations, mostly owing their origin to the EU, which on the face of it would be apposite to apply to the current um, pandemic. You've got the workplace regulations requiring clean and ventilated workplaces, requiring safe means of circulation. You've got, of course, the PPE regulations requiring the provision of suitable personal and protective equipment if the risk can't be constrained by controlled by other means, and which would, of course, require masks. And lastly, you've got the COSH regulations on regulating um, uh, hazardous substances to, to health. Add on top of that the management of health and safety at work regulations that John's already alluded to that require a proper risk assessment that's got to be kept under review and the duties to consult with worker representatives, the trade union, recognised trade unions in the first place under the 77 safety regs. So it all looks, it all looks great. Um, the problem is, of course, what actually happens in fact. It's often an empirical problem rather than a legal one. The, the primary duties are, in, are only owed to employees, but in a sense, you know, big deal. You can probably stretch it to encompass worker in many cases as the EU background requires. The biggest problem is the uh, issue of enforcement. And you can trace the ideology back to 2013 when the inveterate Christopher Chris Grayling, he really does pop up everywhere, decided in a sweep to remove civil sanctions for breach of health and safety regulations, a right that had gone back, dated back to the 19th century in a case I think called Couch and Steel, and had been consistently upheld by the courts and reinforced by the legislature in all the successive legislation. And that, at a stroke, that right was struck, was struck aside without giving any reasons. Now, the effect of that is that um, it's only criminal sanctions for the enforcement of these regulations. John will say a little bit about the common law. But that's been a huge um, change because all, all the work done by Professor Lerstedt and others who was provided some of the background relevant to the claims suggested that it was the risk of civil sanctions that troubled employers far more than criminal sanctions. And so the real problem now is that the only sanctions for breach of these regulations are the criminal law. And that, of course, is dependent upon enforcement being taken by the HSC or the, the relevant criminal bodies. Um, and that's the, that's the enforcement deficit that we face. John, over to you on common law. Yeah, thanks, uh, Michael. Um, the, the, the common law is the, is the law which is decided by the judges and they built up a body of, of law on health and safety at work over the last 150 or nearly 200 uh, years. Uh, some of it, the early stuff, wasn't very helpful to workers, but the current position is that that on every, every employer, there, there's a, uh, 
a fourfold duty and the four duties are to provide and maintain a safe place of work, to provide and maintain a safe system of work, to provide safe and adequate equipment uh, to, to conduct the work and to provide a safe uh, and adequate staff to a, a carry out the, the work. Now, most of those uh, uh, duties uh, are uh, perhaps not relevant to uh, COVID, but certainly the requirement to maintain a safe place of work uh, and uh, to provide uh, safe and adequate equipment, which must, which which uh, includes uh, personal protective equipment, are highly uh, relevant. The problem, as, as Michael says, is, is really not, not so much the law duties are, are almost invariably only relevant when somebody gets injured or sick or dies and uh, a court case is brought against the employer and damages can be uh, awarded. Now, Years I'm, later. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that there have actually been any uh, cases brought in the courts for compensation by way of damages for contracting COVID-19 at work. Of course, it's very difficult to prove that you contracted COVID-19 at work because it might well be that you contracted it at home or in the garden, walking down the street or taking public transport to and from work or some, for some other uh, purpose. So that's a, that's going to be a major uh, problem. Mm. But uh, um, the the fact that these duties exist and are imposed on employers would enable a a union, because no individual employer would be able to do it, but a union uh, supporting a worker to bring a case for an injunction. That's to say a court order preventing an employer conducting, conducting uh, its workplace unsafely or failing to provide adequate um, PPE and so on. Those, those are options, that, that is an option that remains op open. But it would be pretty groundbreaking for it to be done, but I don't see why it shouldn't be done. Mm. Well, we wrote about that a long time ago, didn't we? We did. Um, but it's something that's not really been picked up on much. I suspect it's partly because personal injury lawyers tend to operate in little um, their own particular silos. And the idea of expanding injunction relief out is alien to most of them. I mean, most of them only spend their life calculating damages and not looking up from their desk. But it's, it's odd in a way because that, that's the only sensible remedy in a case involving COVID. As you say, causation after the event is useless. I mean, causation may, and of course it may mean that someone's dead once, you know. Yeah. So you need, you need pro, proactive remedies. But when you listen to um, Phil talk about some of those outbreaks like at the DVLA and so on, they, they would be situations where um, uh, an injunction should at least be considered perhaps mm. because you've got really strong evidence that that transmission at work is posing a continuing danger to those who are required to uh, uh, continue to work there. Yeah, I'm not aware of anyone ever of having brought an injunction application. Are you, John? No, I don't think so, no. Yeah. It, I mean, the last thing I wanted to say about the common law of, it, it is, of course, it's, it's the only legal weapon apart from what you're going to talk about in a moment, section 44 and so on, it's the only legal weapon which remains in the hands of workers because yeah. of that, that 2013 amendment to the legislation prevents workers and their unions relying on the statutory uh, legislation to bring action against uh, employers. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, and anyway, so... Um, we, I'd better be quick on the um, section 44. Now, I'm sure everyone's heard about these. These are the rights workers have to leave the workplace in circumstances of serious and imminent danger. 
um, or rather which they reasonably believe to be serious and imminent. And there are additional protections for safety representatives and those who bring their employers protect, um, bring to their employers attention circumstances of danger. So this, which we owe to the EU framework directive is potentially um, another important right on paper. Question is what actually happens to this one in fact. Now, just to say a couple of things about it. Because of the, a successful judicial review bought by the IWGB, this right, at least the, the right for existing employees, ex now extends to workers. Um, the government's already introduced uh, draft regulations amending the legislation, which will come into effect at the end of May. Not the right to unfair dismissal, though. The right to claim unfair dismissal on these grounds remains restricted to employees. You don't need continuity. Um, there's no urgent relief available. There's no interim relief is available for some forms of trade union um, dismissals and for the provisions re relating to safety representatives, but not for individuals. So again, one of the issues is an individual has to kind of take the decision whether or not to leave the um, workplace. And that really brings me back to my, my point about the individual focus of these of these provisions because it's all based on the individual's state of mind does the individual reasonably believe that the circumstances of danger are serious and imminent so it's the individual's subjective test but with an objective overlay and it's not easy to predict in advance you, you, you'd you'd be very you wouldn't be happy about giving people advice generally as to whether or not they're entitled to leave the workplace because of what they fear about covid um, and there are really, I suppose, that, that that's issue one, the uncertainty of the provision. Will a, will a tribunal find that your fear was, were, it was a reasonable fear of serious and imminent danger? I think we've only seen one tribunal case on it. I've not seen anything beyond the tribunal, a case called Rogers and Leeds Laser, where an employer, an employee left the workplace, a colleague got COVID, he got a cough, there was there is some measures of social distancing and washing and masks at the workplace, and he the he the, the employee was worried about a vulnerable child of his. He, he said his child was very vulnerable, and he lost because the tribunal concluded that um, uh, he didn't objectively have a reason. Uh, uh, he didn't reasonably believe that it was the circumstances of the workplace which were constituted a serious and imminent danger. Rather, he was worried about the dangers generally. He, he, he really wanted to go into his home because he was worried about the risk to his child in general. Now, we can debate until the cows come home whether or not the tribunal there correctly applied the law or not. But I, I draw attention to it really to emphasise how uncertain this stuff is when it comes to its application for individuals who have to take the decision to leave. Because um, they, they place themselves at risk of dismissal, of course, because if they're wrong, they can be dismissed because they've now left the workplace. So that's step one, problem one, the uncertainty. Now, the, the other difficulty is the intersection with collective rights, which I mentioned at the beginning. Because if the trade union says to people, look, we think this is a serious and imminent danger, you should leave the, we think you can leave the workplace. It risks being held to have induced industrial action. And up to date, the courts have said, look, you can't rely on these individual rights to rewrite the collective laws on industrial action. So in a case called Aikson, which I had the misfortune to lose, Patrick Elias in the AAT said this, this, the, these provisions weren't designed to protect against the taking of industrial action. And, and in a later POA case, the court said the same. So you see this real tension between the individual's right and the union's position, because if the union begins to advise people, we think there's a serious and imminent danger. It risks being an immediate, and they leave the workplace, it risks being an immediate breach of all the strike laws because it won't have balloted, it won't have complied with all the statutory steps. So the, the individual model creates a double problem, uncertainty from the individual's perspective and the paralysis of the, of the body to take collective action. And you, 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 many of you will have seen this, uh, this, uh, this issue was potentially highlighted with teachers recently because 
prior to whichever lockdown it was, the various teachers unions and, and other unions were, were involved in advising, let's put it neutrally, their members not to attend the workplace. And, you know, you can see this very, fortunately, the issue went away, but you could have seen this problem coming very much to the fore. So, there you go. Well, um, I think it just remains for me to uh, wind up with a few w words, Cad. And uh, although Michael and I have been rather depressing about the state of the uh, existing law on health and safety and its application to COVID-19, it does at least exist. And uh, we think we're right to be critical of the uh, highly critical of the government in not drawing the attention of employers and workers to the fact that this body of law does exist. And not only that, but the statutory laws that Michael uh, described, uh, it is a criminal offence not to comply with them. And yeah. employers are failing to comply with them, and they're not being prosecuted by the HSE for, for doing so. But that's can I, the subject. Can I just jump, jump in there, uh, John? Sorry. I've always found it interesting that the if you, if you look historically, the criminal law was always used as the worst sanction. But in fact, the changes of 2013 were introduced really as part of a deregulatory agenda because they were introduced against a background of knowing the criminal law wouldn't be particularly well enforced. So it's an interesting shift in what we've seen historically that the criminal law far from is actually used as part of a deregulatory move. I didn't find that presentation depressing at all, so certainly don't apologise for it. Um, I think, uh, thanks for your, your conversation has certainly highlighted important aspects of the of labour law um, that are integral to how we as trade unionists respond to the dangers at the workplace. So, you know, whether that is the IWG case IWGB case and the question of who is covered and who can expect protection, whether it's um, the question of when you can remove yourself from unsafe workplaces uh, is important. And particularly I found interesting, it was the possibility of taking strategic cases in those areas where um, uh, uh, COVID outbreaks take place. Maybe that's something that the Institute can look into in terms of whether we can pursue some of those strategic cases or injunctions. Uh, no doubt we'll be discussing that at our next meeting. I think your, your presentations anyway have raised um, lots of comments and questions in the chat box, which we will get to after our next speaker who is uh, Janet Newsham. Now, there's already been mention made of uh, hazards. Um, and Janet is the, oh, what are you, Janet? You are the coordinator and chair uh, of uh, Hazards based in Manchester, an excellent organization campaigning on all issues, health and safety. I'm sure I don't need to say that to this audience. IER work closely with Hazards in producing our report. And I would recommend that you watch uh, the excellent uh, video that they did where they presented a workers course during which they placed the government, the HSE and employers on trial for failing to fulfil their duties. Uh, obviously, they found them all guilty, um, but at least you gave them a chance. And I, I thought that was an excellent initiative and very good. And Hazards will continue to work with us uh, into stage two of our project. Um, I believe um, I believe that Janet is going to look at uh, work of voice and representation. That wasn't the chapter that she wrote in our report, but the person who wrote that, Dave Walters, couldn't come here today. But she is on the she's on the case of work of representation and their rights um, throughout her day to day work. So Janet, over to you. Oh, thank you very much, and thank you for the invitation to speak and the opportunity to contribute to this excellent initiative by the IER. As Rory O'Neill says in the Hazards magazine, the pandemic didn't cause an occupational health crisis, it exposed it. Everyone should have the basic human right to safe and healthy work. And we need the HSC uh, to enforce health and safety law to protect workers and prevent ill health. Before the pandemic, the HSC was uh, on its knees, starved of resources and staff, decades in the making, and workers continued to be exposed to unsafe and unhealthy workplaces. 
much of which wasn't investigated or employers held to account or even counted in the annual published statistics. Hundreds of workplace suicides ignored every year, even where workers died on their employer's premises or as a result of workplace bullying with evidence of the despair workers were suffering with. It wasn't even talked about by the HSC. Workers exposed to hazardous substances, chemicals and toxic workplace environments leading to life shortening ill health, most of which wasn't even read or reported by employers, employers without any consequences and wasn't even investigated by the HSC. Then along came the pandemic. An HSC cut to the bones and unable, and you would say, you could say unwilling to respond. An HSC which didn't prioritise the enforcement of safety reps and safety committee regulations prior to the pandemic and which now don't seem to, need to see the need to enforce it after the pandemic or during the pandemic. Safety reps that could have been engaged to help them ensure the controls of risks of transmissions in the workplaces weren't supported. Hundreds of thousands of workers found themselves in the epicentre of a workplace catastrophe, not just those in high risk employment, but those who now became at risk because they were needed to continue to work to provide support, health care and other essential services to keep others safe. And we also know that non-essential workers continued to be in workplaces, ignoring the risks to their health. Prior to the pandemic, the HSC had deliberately marginalised workers' voices and representation. It was a political move, removing the valuable contribution whilst maximising their employer's influence. Whilst other countries moved to increase the health and safety of workers and their representatives by pro providing platforms for them to speak, report concerns and ensure that they, they were working in safe and healthy working conditions, the UK government has spent decades undermining and reducing this role. And where workers were on precarious contracts, they were treated as disposable without any recourse to enforcement. Workers have been on the front line, exposed without adequate controls of risks and dying in their thousands. And the UK has been on a roller coaster of lockdowns, body bags piling up when the government failed to reduce the transmission risks and then further lockdowns. Their path has been about economy above health. And as England emerges from lockdown again, the main conversation is about how soon we can get pubs and restaurants open, how soon we can watch live football. Uh, and how soon we can go on holiday. It suits our government to ignore the thousands of people who have died, who have become collateral damage in this pandemic as they chose their deadly priorities. At the same time, we know that workplaces are not controlling the risks of trans transmission and workers, uh, workplaces include education organisations, schools, colleges, universities, workplaces like shops, public transport, offices, factories, construction sites, mail rooms, distribution centres, prisons, hospitals, care homes, etc. Thousands have died from and in those settings and the transmission ris risks remain the same. Aerosols, direct, indirect and large droplets spread. The controls needed to remove the risks are the same as any other risk using a hierarchical approach as we've heard from John and uh, Michael. This isn't rocket science, it is normal controls of risks uh, using a risk assessment. Look at the HSE website. However, we know thousands of workers have been exposed to infection, thousands have been left with long COVID, thousands have died and thousands will have infected family members and their community when they travel on public transport or visit shops. The TUC survey, as Cad mentioned earlier, a survey of more than 2,100 workplace safety rates, one of the biggest surveys that's ever been conducted by the TUC, it reveals employer failures on risk assessments, social distancing and PPE during the pandemic. More than a quarter of safety reps were not aware of a risk assessment in their workplace in the last two years, despite a legal requirement to consult them. The HSC has failed to enforce health and safety law and Public Health England has done little to ensure workers safety and health. Not even a precaution level of PPE or a shared intelligence on transmission risks workers have been exposed to even though many workplaces are not covered by trade union organisations, which leaves workers twice as likely to be in unsafe and unhealthy at work. The enforcement authorities have not acted to protect workers. And even where there are trained active safety reps, the HSC has not supported or encouraged them. Safety reps and safety committee regulations continue not to be enforced. Worse than that, the HSC have declared this a low priority and not one worth pursuing when reps report their concerns and anxieties to the HSC. 
despite being in a pandemic and despite the fact that thousands of workers have been put at risk, this was not enough, a high enough priority for them. Safety reps trying to hold employers to account have been victimised, disciplined and dismissed. And workers forced to sign non-disclosure agreements to protect their employers. Where are the HSC challenging these abuses? Last week, I was contacted by a safety rep who was having difficulty getting information from their employer. In a workplace with a cluster of COVID cases, they were trying to investigate how workers had become infected by COVID-19. In response, they were told by their employer it was illegal for them to have information, that it would be a breach of GDPR, that it was a sensitive information. This is just one of several safety reps unable to investigate infections and ensure that the employer was controlling all the transmission risk, which is a legitimate role for safety reps. During the pandemic, we have constantly been informed by safety reps that employers have denied them access to risk assessments, that employers say, uh, say they didn't need to review or update the risk assessments because they were controlling all the risks, even when new information had become available, including the risk of aeros aerosol transmissions. And when the HSC have inspected, uh, the very few that they have inspected, safety reps have not been contacted by the inspectors or been informed that their employer, or even informed that the employer would pass on any official re report. In one case, HSC inspectors came on site, spoke to the employer, and then agreed no further action was necessary. No report was done, and definitely no one consulted the safety rep. What this means is there's not an independent voice being consulted. The trained safety reps who may or may not agree with what the employer is saying is not asked, even asked for their opinion on how the employer is controlling the risk. It is a fundamental failure of the enforcement authorities to value their input and just report it in the construction news. This week, HSE inspectors, inspections carried out by debt collectors, not even leaving the management's office. There has been little and no mention of safety reps' rights or functions in any of the guidance produced by the government or HSC. Little mention of the need of employers to consult with reps about COVID-19, establish joint committees or review uh, risk assessments and to control the transmission risk. No mention of how reps could help to ensure that employers are controlling the risks, looking at additional roles like other countries where safety reps can issue pr uh, pins, pr uh, provisional improvement notices or order unsafe work to stop no mention of roving reps other than in Scotland. Trained safety reps who could support and help with control of transmission risk in non-organised workplaces. The HSC will never be forgiven for its role in this pandemic. It's an abject failure to ensure the employers have only been allowed to continue where they are controlling the risks and taking a precautionary approach to this. Existing research shows that workers are twice as safe where there is a trained and active trade union safety rep. And trade union safety reps have not only actively protected workers throughout the pandemic, they have saved thousands of lives. I don't think the same can be said of the debt collectors carrying out the HSC roles without expertise, adequate training or the responsibility necessary to hold employers to account. Even in the US, with its new administration, there are now, they are now reviewing their health and safety protection of workers by prioritising targeting those most at risk, increasing inspections, and ensuring risks are being controlled. In the UK, enforcement authorities are paralysed by political dogma, indifferent to workers' health and safety. This year, International Workers' Memorial Day theme is the fundamental right to safe and healthy work, a global demand amidst the global pandemic. And with more than 14,000 workers dead from COVID in the UK, clearly this is a demand that's urgently needed. Thank you. <clears throat> Brilliant. Thanks very much for that, Janice. Uh, your day-to-day -day experience of discussion and the living examples um, just shine through in your understanding and knowledge of the role of uh, reps. And, and you're quite right. There's over 100,000. Uh, there's an army of trade union health and safety reps out there willing to contribute to the fight against COVID, and yet they were ignored despite the regulations that give them a role to play in how workplace health and safety should be monitored and enforced. Thank you very much for that. Um, so, um, we have a number of questions and comments in the chat box. We've got a question from Jonathan Fluxman. Are there legal grounds to compensation for getting infected with COVID at work? 
um, the employer, of course, might argue that they have implemented all the official guidelines, which are, of course, inadequate. So there's one. And there is another one from Mark Morris, who is dealing with a local authority director of education in Wales, who refuses to agree that there is a statutory framework requiring consultation over health and safety matters. Um, and that's despite the fact that in Wales they have additional regulation. Having failed to win the argument, he says, apart from collective dispute, does anyone have any thought on where to go? So that, that's a trade union one and a legal one. Shall we start with those two? Shall I do the compensation at work? And Why not? Yeah, well, I mean, there's no reason why, why compensation at work shouldn't be awarded for somebody that can prove that they contracted COVID-19 at uh, work and the legal requirements were uh, breached. The, the uh, practice that's recommended is really uh, not so influential. The question is whether, they, whether the employer has done, taken uh, reasonable steps to protect the, the worker. So it's all gonna depend on the, on the circumstances. But, and, cause, uh, and causation. And causation, yeah. Causation. Although I wonder, John, you'd know more about it than me, whether those old cases like McGee on material contribution might even help on causation. It, it, might, uh, it, might, it might do, yeah, yeah. Causation is a complicated legal issue about what caused the disease or the, or the injury. Normally, you know, somebody falls down a hole and breaks a leg, you, you haven't got much of a problem with causation. But with uh, di industrial diseases, and which would include COVID-19, uh, proving that the contraction was at work is a more difficult one. But it yeah, may yeah. be, what Michael's saying is it, it may be sufficient to prove that exposure at work made a material contribution to getting the disease or could have done. So um, yeah, no reason in, in principle, consult your union's uh, uh, solicitors uh, over that. And the refusal to agree that there's a statutory framework for consult consulting safety reps and so on, that's extraordinary. I mean, it's, it's written in the legislation. You can download it uh, from Google. I mean, how can they, uh, refuse to agree that this, the statute exists. It's, it seems amazing. But once again, I would have thought that, Michael, I don't know what you think, but isn't, isn't that one for to go to the union and say, get the uh, lawyers to write a letter to them? Yeah, well, I don't want to keep plugging that they um, involve lawyers in it. But the thing is, um, once again, we're faced with the oddity that the duties under the 1977 regs for consulting with the unions are strictly subject to criminal sanctions, which isn't really of much use. You can imagine the HSC and its constrained budget dealing with workplace fatalities probably won't be very interested in that. But there is another avenue for enforcement. Um, I can't remember who asked the question, was it? Um, Jonathan, what? Uh, no, sorry, it was... Uh, Mark. Mark, yeah. Where, where you're against a public sector body, there is a potential judicial review argument. And there's at least one case Fire Brigades Union um, and South Yorkshire Fire Authority, I think it was, where the court allowed, granted a declaration in judicial review proceedings to the effect that the employer had failed to comply with its work and working time duties, which were only enforceable by criminal sanctions. So there, there is the potential for that argument as a, probably mainly to use as a threat mark that look, if you don't consult with us in light of these clear statutory duties, this is the sort of thing that could be enforceable via judicial review on the basis that you as a public sector body should comply with the statutory requirements that govern you. I mean, it's no more complicated than that. I did see one question. It's not, it's not reached this one, but on the other thread saying, well, is the position as clear as I've said it in relation to industrial action and, um, and uh, section 44 and 100. Well, the, the, again, it's in a case called Secretary of State of Justice and the Prison Officers Association. It wasn't concerned with COVID. The court there said, 
um, these things address different points. So if the trade union tells people or advises them to leave the workplace, even though they're, they're, they may be in circumstances of serious imminent danger, that will constitute inducing breach of contract and therefore a strike. They did say that there's nothing wrong, I'm quoting here, with the POA expressing understanding and support for prison officers' concerns about dangerous situations. And the POA is entitled to advise its members generally on the terms of effect of Section 44. However, the POA may not directly or in, indirectly induce, advise or encourage prison officers or group of prison officers to walk off the job for any reason. Now, there's a very, very thin line between when advising is encouragement. And that's the thin line that unions have to tread in these circumstances, because if it tips from just being going beyond the provision of mere advice, it's likely to be industrial action. And I think it's a big problem in this area. Thanks very much for that, uh, Michael. Um, there are some comments. Rory O'Neill has submitted one. The UK is a bad actor on compensation like everything else. Um, it's refused to prescribe COVID-19 as an occupational disease for state compensation, despite many other nations seeing this uh, as a slam dunk, as he calls it. Um, a review of global practices by the Global Union Uni to be published in April shows the UK way down the best practice league table, as it is <clears throat> in so many other tables of international good standards. Just come back to that uh, riddle question. Yeah. Because uh, the, the, what the regulation actually says is, uh, is regulation nine. It says where in relation to a person at work, the responsible person, that's the employer, receives a diagnosis of blah, 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 any disease attributed to an occupational exposure to ah. a biological agent. Yes. The responsible person must follow the reporting procedure. So you need a diagnosis and it must be in relation to a person at work, but it doesn't say and uh, proof that the disease was contracted at work. And that's what the HSE guidance su suggests or implies. So I think that it's too restrictive. The, the guidance is too restrictive and RIDOR requires anybody who is at work who has a diagnosis of COVID-19, that, that should be reportable. And it's, of course, what the effect of it is that it's led to gross underestimation of the number of cases contracted at work. Mm. Yeah, I just wanted to say that, you know, that uh, John's right about the RIDOR report, RIDOR reporting um, guidance being overly um, discouraging, really. They've, they've actively discouraged reps from uh, reporting uh, or, or, or employees from reporting RIDOR. But if, we've got examples where paramedics have died and employers are refusing to report them as Riddle report them. So they are extreme cases where there is a, you know, a real close uh, connection with the work that, and the exposure they've had, not least because they've not been given a precautionary level of PPE um, and you know, they're not, they've not recorded any of the infections or the deaths. Um, and what we're saying to people is they need to, our reps need to be putting together a paper trail of infections because they're not, a lot of these people who've got COVID are not been tested and they're not hospitalized, but they're left with massive long-term ill health and disabilities as well. And unless there's some evidence that they've got, you know, there's been contractions in the workplace, there's been infections in the workplace, they will have great difficulty in proving that in any court of law. And so we need to make sure that they, you know, that they're armed. And you can just imagine in workplaces without safety reps, how difficult this is gonna be for those, those people. And you know that's why the HSC have been absolutely dismal in their response to protecting workers. Thanks, Jan. Uh, we normally say at this point that um, it's not actually the workers at the HSC that we are uh, blaming for any of this. Like everywhere else, they are the workers. There is those who are setting the tone, um, the style, and the focus of the organisation, as well as the government who are restricting through funding. Um, that um, that are, are that we see as being the main reason for the weaknesses um, and the failures of the HSA, not the workers. Um, Phil, would you like to come in and say something? 
I was yeah, looking I, th at I think the, I think the underreporting is is a really 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 significant issue. I mean, um, the, as as Janet says, the, the discouragement of anybody, you know, of employers to report, of anybody to report, and so on. I mean, we have to, insofar as we can, counter this as much as possible, and we're developing sort of techniques, tactics, and weapons as we go along. And one of them is, and you know, again, this is about the insofar as what places are organised. We need to keep the evidence from build up the evidence, diaries, workplace diaries, incident incident diaries, all of that that accumulates and provides at least some sort of local evidence base if cases do come up that then have to be legally challenged and so on. And, you know, one thing that I did with my very first surveys was, you know, uh, when we put the survey out and we were getting clusters of responses from particular workplaces that the unions then could then use as evidence base against employers to get people out of the out of the workplace. Now, I know in, from this that it's probably got examples of about 11 or a dozen workplaces where people died, right? Now, these were not reported to Redor. And I'm, I, I, again, I mean, it depends how much time you've got in your life really to do this stuff, but I would really like to have a, a proper close look at the ONS statistics and the, the figures that they are attributing to, to the standard occupational categories, because these, these are huge underestimates. Mm -hmm. And it's, I suppose in this case, the, the health and safety reps as a, as a source of data and a mechanism for doing it. I'm gonna have a look at both the, the TUC survey and, and Shan's work from Greenwich as well. But we need to, as much as possible, use our networks to build up data at workplace level to challenge this. I think it's an evidence-based thing as well as campaigning. Absolutely. Thanks very much for that, Phil. Um, Rory O'Neill has put a few comments in the chat box, um, directing us, of course, to the wonderful uh, Hazards magazine. Uh, he is editor of. I should point out that Rory was also a contributor. There are a number of contributors to our publication who did help with the work or who haven't been able to join us here today, um, including, well, Rory is with us tonight, um, and Dave Walters, Andrew Watterson and David White also contributed to the publication. Um, we will be hearing from Steve Toombs uh, and Phil James after our break. Um, we're going to start this next session um, with Professor Steve Toombs. He is Professor of Criminology at the Open University. He has a long-standing interest in the incidents, nature and regulation of corporate and state crime and harm. He has a long uh, work and history with the hazards movement in the UK and is a trustee and board member of Inquest. Steve was also a um, great contributor to the IER's Health and Safety Act. Uh, project. Um, he continues to wait with us. I believe, uh, Steve, you were the, ju the judge in the uh, Hazards a Workers' Course initiative, which uh, I've already plugged once this morning <laughs> and went down very well. I believe that was you, wasn't it? You didn't have your robes and your, your hair on, but nevertheless, you did an excellent job. So, Steve is going to talk to us today about HSE oversight and enforcement issues, and he has a presentation to share with us too. So, over to you, Steve. Thanks very much, Cad. So, thanks to you, to Sarah, to James at the Institute for setting this up and for the invite. Also, so just acknowledge the work of my friend David White. Dave, here, but this is this is our kind of joint work, isn't it? Much of my work owes an, an awful lot to, to, to Dave in any case. Um, so, look, I'm, I'm going to take us back to last May uh, to, to, to to May the 10th. Some, somebody earlier, I think John took us back to May the 11th, which was the Monday when all of the co with secure workplace regs started to, to pour out of government, made up on the back of fag packing, I suspect. The night before, on a Sunday at seven o'clock, Johnson went on national television. He urged people to return to what he would call COVID-19 secure workplaces the very next day on the Monday morning. Of course, in the, in the end, I mean, that didn't happen, right? I mean, he then asked people to go back on the Wednesday. And in fact, that didn't really happen very much until June or July. But in any case, the kind of, the, the, the urge was Go 
back to work. It's worth saying at the point, the seven-day rolling average of coronavirus sky to declare normality. Right? Um, the reference to lockdown and going back to work also ignored the fact that many people had never stopped going to work. <laughs> right? I mean, not everyone has a luxury of us middle-class people uh, op operating through Zoom and Microsoft, Microsoft Teams, of course. So um, all, the, all of the workers in health and social care settings and emergency services, transport and shop workers, those in the food supply chain, cleaners, posties, refuse collectors, some teachers, construction workers, call centre workers and security staff, to name but a few, they'd all, and those in the gig economy, they'd all carried on working. And of course, they were all, they were all the groups of people, of workers who were disproportionately uh, uh, exposed to and killed by the virus. OK, back to Johnson's announcement on that Sunday night. I was sitting downstairs, I was downstairs making, making the tea and it kind of nearly tripped over myself when he said HSE will be having spot inspections to ensure that businesses are keeping employees safe. Workplaces would, through these spot inspections, uh, be, be COVID secure. And to that end, he pledged £14 million extra funding for the HSE to oversee these so-called spot inspections. And, and I just want to kind of, in the next couple of slides, put this initiative and the extra £14 million uh, for HSE in a bit of context before returning to these so-called spot inspections themselves. Now, the first context is what a bit happening to HSE in terms of its enforcement capacity and other speakers have already alluded to this today uh, earlier on. So Conservative governments over the previous 10 years to this point from, ninth, from uh, 2010 onwards has spent most of that period systematically and busily undermining myself and my colleague Dave White um, were arguing and people at Hazards and IER were arguing that the HSE and in fact, cease to be an enforcement credible, a credible enforcement body at this point. Now, I'm not going to go through all of this data in, in any detail, but what this does is this is based upon uh, it's the most recent data available at the time. It's based upon freedom of information requests, most of it, um, as is data on subsequent slides. Uh, it looks at it looks at inputs and outputs in terms of enforcement. Uh, HSE enforcement capacity over over the decade. Uh, so you'll see on the first bullet that over a 10 year period up to 2020. Uh, HSE funding from central government has fallen by over 100 million. Remember, Johnson was pledging an extra 14 million, right? It's already fallen by over 100 million. That, of course, meant that numbers of inspectors have declined. Uh, prospects estimate that there are currently less than 500 prospects, the, uh, the Union for Health and Safety Inspectors. Uh, prospect estimates there are less than 500 inspectors who are actually doing inspecting. Of course, there are inspection, inspectors for inspections fell. Enforcement notices, the main enfor formal enforcement tool, they fell significantly during the decade. The most serious ones, prohibition notices, notices to job, stop the job immediately, uh, they fell most precipitously. Uh, and also convictions fell down to a very penny figure um, across the millions of workplaces in, in, in the UK or in Britain. So uh, they fell to 467 convictions of employers for breaches of health and safety offences. the most recent year for which figures are available in nine. So it, was, it was purely coincidental, but it's, it's crucially, crucially ironic that in March 2020, uh, Martin Temple, who was then chair of the HSE, was giving evidence to a DWP select committee uh, where he talked about the numbers of inspections and he talked about the numbers of workplaces and duty holders to be inspected. And if you did the calculation using these figures, he didn't do this calculation, but if you did the calculation using Martin Temple's own figures, you find out that the statistical likelihood of any one duty holder, employer, being inspected by the HSE in any one year was one in every in 275. So I'm a reasonably law-abiding person, right? I get on Mersey Rail and I get on the bus. You know, I don't drive, right? So I use public transport. If I knew I'd only be asked for a ticket once every 275 years, I'd stop buying a ticket. Law without enforcement is not law. It has no credibility. So that's the HSE for you. If we turn to the other kind of uh, uh, main enforcement arm of the health and safety enforcement regime in the UK, that's in, in Great Britain, that's local authorities. So local authority environmental health officers um, have their own areas of responsibility, own, own, their own businesses and workplaces sectors in which they enforce health and safety law. And again, we find, you know, as you'd expect post 2008, during the period of austerity, we know local authorities were hit especially hard in terms of central government funding. We also know, by the way, that the poorest local authorities were hit hardest. Um, 
but we know that during this period, um, enforcement capacities in health and safety and other areas, food safety, trading standards, were pretty much hollowed out. Regulatory services across local authorities um, were pretty much hollowed out during this period. Again, I won't go through the data in duty. You can see that during this decade, visits, enforcement notices, convictions down to a puny 80 in 2018-19, uh, pretty much on the floor, pretty much collapsed enforcement activity. There were also during this period some more formal barriers to enforcement, which were constructed uh, through central government initiatives. One was the designation, completely arbitrary designation, for a whole swathe of workplaces as low risk. Uh, which meant that preventative inspections were no longer were no longer legal. Local authorities and indeed HSC in some contexts couldn't carry out preventative inspections of, of workplaces and sectors which were deemed low risk, and most of those were very far from low risk. Um, that was determined at the sweep of, sweep of a pen, and also something kind of quite esoteric in a way, but really insidious, called the primary authority scheme, uh, which operated at local authority level. The primary authority scheme applied to businesses which had operations in more than one local authority area. So if you take somebody like Greg's, for example, uh, which operates in the 400 plus local authorities of England, Wales and Scotland, Greg could enter into a contractual relationship, a monitoring contractual relationship with one local authority. In the case of Greg's, it was Newcastle, Newcastle City Council. A Newcastle City Council was the pertaining to Greg's in any part of the country had to go through. So effectively every other local authority apart from Greg's had its enforcement capacity, sorry, apart from Newcastle, had its enforcement capacity vis-a-vis -vis local grid stores removed, right? So it's effectively a, a way of stopping local authority enforcement of this which operated across, uh, uh, across um, local, local authorities make returns to HSE, which document kind of inputs and outputs into, in terms of enforcement activity. But the most recent of those returns, or the most recent I, ha I have available, was April 2020. At that point, seven local authorities in, in England, this is, seven local authorities in England had no health in this in respect of health and safety. Um, Prior to that, between 2014 and 2017, the city of Liverpool, with about 20,000 businesses in which to enforce health and safety, also had no health and safety enforcement capacity, not one single officer in place. I was told in an interview that food, food safety officers would, quote, look out for health and safety when they were doing food safety checks. In April 2020, 135 local authorities had less than one full-time equivalent health and safety EHO. Again, so, so almost non-existent. Uh, health and safety enforcement capacity at local authority level. So let's go back to the let's go back to this, this spot inspections and, and, and the, the 14 million pounds that was given to HSC to ensure that, that workplaces could be uh, to use that illusory claim, that fallacious claim as somebody referred to it earlier on, COVID secure, I think it was Tracy. Uh, now the first thing to say about, about the spot check inspections is that they weren't inspections, right? Um, uh, spot checks, this, again, these, these quotations come from Freedom of Information Responses from, from HSE. Spot check inspection, inspections were actually referred to a three-stage process. The first, first part of the process was stage one, as you might expect. And stage one was a 15-minute scripted question set um, to ensure that, to check that a business was, about, it was following COVID, COVID guidance. So it was what was called a tick box exercise where uh, uh, somebody got on the phone, went through 15 minutes of questions, and if they were kind of satisfied, then that firm would be ticked off, COVID secure, stick that one in the drawer, and let's move on to another phone, another 15 minutes. If there were any small flag, any flags raised during that 15 minute stage one spot check phone call, then there would be another phone call. So now enforcement's getting really heavy, right? I've got to pick up the phone once, now I've got to pick it up twice. And this isn't a script, right? I might get asked questions if you're off script. A more detailed conversation, so it says HSE, delving into any areas of potential concern. So stage one, stage two are phone calls. It's also worth knowing that these phone calls aren't carried out by HSE inspectors. They're not carried out by HSE staff. Over half, £7.2 million pounds of the £40 million pounds extra funds given to HSE went, thanks to Rory, Rory O'Neill at Hazards for this information, went to two debt collection companies, two private companies, or referred to by HSE as approved partners, um, 
two private companies, debt collection companies, engaged services and CDER group, no experience of, of health and safety, and they carried out uh, all, the vast majority of those spot check phone calls. A very small proportion of COVID spot check phone calls led to further action, and they, these were kind of visits. Again, it's important to say, and, and, and uh, Stephen Hester of Prospect has made this point very, really forcefully on, on many several occasions when, I, when I've kind of made this point about spot check visits. He just wants to be very clear: spot check visits under around COVID security are not akin to inspection. Right? They are much kind of much uh, a, a, a briefer more superficial than an HSE inspection. But as, alongside 15, nearly 16,000 spot check phone calls, just under 5,000 of those led to these visits, kind of checks to ensure that COVID security was being, uh, 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 being met, COVID guidance was, uh, was in false. So out of all that activity, out of those almost 5,000 spot check visits, uh, they were generated 78 enforcement notices uh, and no prosecutions. This, is, this data comes from the first six months, April through to the end of September of COVID enforcement. Having said that, having said there were no prosecutions in the first six months of, of trying to ensure COVID secure workplaces, it's still the case almost a year later, to the best of my knowledge, and somebody may be able to correct me in the audience, but to the best of my knowledge, there's still not been one single prosecution in related to COVID-19 guidance at work. Uh, in, 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 in Britain, one single prosecution. And you can set that alongside, I think somebody mentioned this earlier, I think again, it might, be, it might be John. You can set that alongside, well, in January, it was estimated there'd been over 40,000 fines against members of the public for breaches of COVID guidance, right? So we've got 14,000 miscreant individuals meeting up, with people, meeting up with our nanny in parks, right? But apparently not one employer has broken COVID security or COVID workplace guidelines to the point where they should be prosecuted. It almost, almost, almost stretches incredulity. Stretches credibility, sorry, it's incredulity. It's incredible. It's incredible. If we, if we, the other, the other thing that we ask alongside the kind of how many, what, what activity they've been in, in relation to COVID-19 security in workplaces, we also asked how many kind of regular inspections have been made over the six month period by HSC of workplace, the kind of stuff that it does year in, year out, right? It's the kind of part of the job of HSC to carry out inspect or, or used to be part of the job of HSC to carry out inspect. inspections. Um, inspections in six months, April to the end of September. So we put that together with, with the spot checks, which aren't inspections, you get about five, five and a half thousand inspections. In other words, and, and so five and a half thousand inspections, even though most of them weren't inspections, right? In the six month period in the year before, HSC had carried out about 9,000 inspections. In other words, when workplaces were becoming much, were, were clearly much more dangerous, sites of COVID transmission, at the point when HSC was needed to a far greater extent, it pretty much went missing, right? It carried out just about half, just under half of the, uh, of the, of the inspections or checks that it carried out in the year before. And there are many other respects and other, other people uh, on this webinar and indeed in the in the audience have documented ways in which, and I think Phil will talk a bit about this in a moment, documented ways in which uh, the HSE disappeared at the point it was most needed. So, some very kind of quick conclusions before I finish. The first thing to say is, that, you know, and, uh, and we kind of know this data, uh, but, uh, but I'm going to reiterate it anyway. On H, we've talked about the poverty of riddle data, and, and riddle data has always been, always been, uh, always drastically reported the numbers of deaths, even, but also occupational illnesses, of course, and and major and so you know. It, it was a, it was a concern based after Robins. But even on HSC's own figures, even on HSC's own annual statistics, their most recent statistics point to the fact that if you take death, uh, deaths from fatal injuries and occupational exposures, there are about 14,000 deaths in British workplaces every year, about 14,000. Uh, there are about 700,000 injuries at work every year. There are about 40 million working days lost through occupational health and safety failures in the workplace every year. So widespread workplace harm is and always has been the norm in the UK. It just, it, that's just how work is, right? I'm not saying it's deceptive, of course it isn't, but that's long been the case. And COVID-19 maybe has started to expose that by, by 
highlighting, shining a light on the fact that disproportionate numbers of people who have died from COVID have been workers in the so-called front line, right, from supermarkets through to care homes. So COVID has kind of exposed this, as it's it exposed much else that's rotten about, about contemporary Britain, I would say. The second point to make, um, and I've, I've been making this point for several years, along with many other people, it's hardly original to me, um, but neither the HSC nor local authority as, as regulatory bodies are, are any longer fit for purpose. We need a review of those bodies. We need a review of their remits. We certainly need a review of how and to the extent to which they're funded. We have a system in health and safety in this country, which is a system of law without effective enforcement. I made that point earlier on. And the last thing to say here, and, and I think it's you know potentially one of the kind of few good things, if you could talk about some good thing coming out of the last year. COVID-19 shows really clearly that workplace health is public health. I mean, work, workplace health and safety is often seen as a really esoteric uh, area that's you know for nerds to be interested, you know, I sit in the back of a taxi and someone says, the taxi driver says to me, you know, or, or in the old days when we used to get taxis, right? The taxi driver says, what do you do? And I say, I'm a professor of criminology. He says, oh, that's interesting. He starts to talk about serial killers. I say, no, I'm interested in health and safety. Well, really, that's real. What COVID-19 has shown is that workplace health is public health. Schools, buses, trains, pubs, shops, universities, colleges, cafes, restaurants, takeaways, all workplaces. Right? Work is all around us. We engage with work. And working and workers all of the time, even when we're not at work. So if nothing comes out of this period, if nothing comes out of the last 12 months, it is to bring, I hope, workplace health into the domain of public health uh, and to, to kind of make clear to all of us that what matters at work uh, matters for all of us, um, whatever, whether we're going to work or not. Yeah. I'll finish on that point. Thanks very much for that, Steve. Um, you were fading in and out there. You had some connection problems, but your slides said it oh, all. Sorry. Now, don't worry, don't worry. It often happens when you're sharing screen as well. So, uh, but your slide said it all. <clears throat> uh, the facts and the figures that you provide expose perfectly the hypocrisy of the government and the failure of the HSE, as you so remarkably set out. Many of your statistics, as you said, had to be dragged out by the freedom of information requests that you're, 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 you're so good at. Um, but as Phil said at the start, why should we need to drag out that information through freedom of information requests? But your dog of perseverance of it, yeah. it creates the facts and figures that allows us to hold both these uh, the government and the HSE to account. So brilliant work. I hadn't realised that Liverpool was lacking a health and safety um, enforcement in the past, which is ironic, really, when you think that the HSE head office is based up here in Liverpool. Yep. Uh, you know, maybe we should yep. go knock on their door and see, you know, where, where, where are the inspections? Where are the inspectors? Um, great. That's marvellous. Thank you so much for that. Um, and as you say, HSE went missing as a regulatory body during this pandemic. Why? It, what were the main issues? You've most listed most of them there. Is it political? Is it financial? Is it incompetence? Well, I think uh, some of those issues are now going to be taken up by our final speaker of this morning, and that is Phil James. Um, Phil uh, edited together our, our report, uh, and he uh, has been leading on our project um, our, our, our health and safety project. Phil is a professor of um, law at Middlesex University. Uh, I've lost my little sheet. I shouldn't need a sheet, should I, to explain who all our wonderful speakers are, but there you go. Uh, professor of Employment Relations at Middlesex University. He's also a member of the Executive Committee of the Institute of Employment Rights. He's researched widely and published lots on the field of industrial relations and occupational health and safety. He has twice served as a specialist advisor to the Work and Pension Select Committee inquiries into work of health and safety executive. Um, he has co-authored a number of IAR publications in the past alongside uh, Dave Walters, uh, Regulating Health and Safety at Work and Agenda for Change. And uh, as I say, he has edited together this latest report. So Phil, over to you. 
Thank you, Caroline. Um, I hope this isn't an anti-climax. I will be repeating some of what is already said. It's the uh, punishment for going last. What I've been asked to do is talk about the future of health and safety regulation. So um, I'm to some degree moving away from COVID. Um, more specifically, what I want to focus on is the future of statutory, the statutory framework of health and safety law. So I won't be engaging with the common law. And really, when we're talking about the statutory framework, we're talking about the framework put in place by the Health and Safety at Work Act 1974. Okay, so that's what I'm really engaging with. That framework of law officially um, continues to receive much endorsement. It's seen, despite the fact that it, uh, the act was passed in 1974, it is seen by government, successive governments and the HSC to have stood the test of time and to be continue, uh, continue to be fit for purpose. My starting point is rather different, and that is that the Act is, has not stood the te test of time, and it is no longer fit for purpose. Um, and I put forward three reasons why I think we need to look again at the approach to statutory law in this area. The, the first is actually almost a historical argument. Um, the Health and Safety at Work Act really put in place the recommendations of the Robins Committee. Um, the Robins Committee reported in 1972. Now, I'm, I'm not a mathematician, but on my calculation, that means we were approaching 50 years ago. If we look at the way the world of work has changed in 50 years, we see a world that is almost completely different to what existed at the time of Robins. Um, for example, we've seen a massive decline of employment in the extractive industries and in manufacturing. We've seen a massive rise in, of employment in the service sectors. We've seen a rise in all kinds of forms of non-standard employment i.e. forms of employment that are not governed by a contract of employment. The workplace uh, has also seen a massive rise in female participation in the labour force. I could go on, but the world of work is very different. Meanwhile, the law, the statutory law we're talking about, has barely changed. Now, this would be truly remarkable if a, a body of law put in place 50 years ago remains entirely relevant. Secondly, what has followed on in the sense or accompanied those changes in the world of work are changes, very significant changes in workplace risk and workplace harm. Um, many occupational diseases, traditional occupational diseases have declined in importance, but it's not that harm has gone away what we've seen are new types of harm emerging. In particular, if you look at HSE surveys, um, the two most common forms of ill health, occupational ill health now, are muscul musculoskeletal disorders and stress, depression, and anxiety. In other words, we're talking about a massive rise in psychosocial harm. Again, the law has not been adjusted to reflect those shifts in harm. The third area is the administration of the law. And here we come on to the Health and Safety Executive. Um, the tale of woe about the HSE has already been dealt with quite comprehensively in the previous presentations. But I think I would just like before moving on to areas of reform, to just draw together what has been said about the HSE in the previous contribution. So I will mention four, five, five problems. One, the HSE has actually been complicit in producing guidance that is entirely inappropriate um, and has actually downplayed risks. In, in particular, I would draw attention to the inappropriateness of guidance around social distancing, 
around ventilation and around face coverings and face masks and PPE in general. So complicit in inappropriate guidance, often published by the way on the auspices of government, but HSE's own guidance stands similarly condemned. Secondly, and this came out very much from John and Michael's contribution, extraordinarily, we've seen guidance produced that virtually mentions no law. Not only does it not mention any law, it also singularly fails to mention the punishments, the penalties that follow on from non-compliance with that law. Um, quite extraordinary. And it's particularly extraordinary when you recognize that HSE is a regulatory body. In other words, we have a regulatory body that is actually downplaying the body of law for which it's responsible for developing and enforcing, which is quite remarkable. Thirdly, fourthly, I've lost count. Um, Janet's contribution highlighted this very clearly. At a time when you would have thought that the value of worker representation and worker voice would be most valuable, the HSE and its guidance has downplayed that as well. Next, as Steve's contribution pointed out, HSE has failed to engage in any effective workplace oversight and enforcement. Um, and finally, and I think this is the greatest condemnation of all, HSE has failed to provide any leadership. It is technically the National Authority for Health and Safety at Work. It has been virtually silent during much of the pandemic. And I'll come back to this point. It seems to have just bent over backwards to um, comply with the wishes of government. Um, in other words, there has been no independence. So I, I argue that these three kind of considerations, one, the changing world of work, to the changing nature of work-related harm, and three, the failures of the HSE, provide a very strong justification for looking again at the statutory framework of health and safety law we have in place. And in fact, the, the second stage of the IER health and safety project is intended to do precisely that, to look at what system of law we need in place to more effectively uh, ensure that worker health and safety is protected. However, um, while we're waiting for those the great thoughts to emerge from that project, um, I'll give you some thoughts of my own, which well, are partly my own and partly the result of other people's ideas about areas of potential reform. And I, I want to pick up on four areas, really. The fir first is not surprising. It's around the resourcing enforcement strategies and independence of the HSE. Um, I, I won't talk a lot about the first two of those, resourcing and enforcement strategies. They almost go, they almost speak for themselves. I mean, Steve outlined the incredible cuts that the HSE has experienced over the last 10 years um, and what that's meant in terms of its enforcement activities. <clears throat> All I will therefore say in relation to those is something needs to be done and that's something comprised of a massive increase in resources and a much adoption of a much more aggressive approach to enforcement. What I'm more, what I think is more challenging um, is the question of independence. When, when the, Rob the Robins Committee actually recommended the establishment of a National Authority for Health and Safety, and in its report, it said that this authority, which became the Health and Safety Commission and is now the HSE, should be granted 
maximum budgetary and operational autonomy. <clears throat> we seem to have the opposite of that now. I could give you numerous, numerous examples of where silently the government is just, uh, ACC has just done the government's bidding. Um, quite extraordinarily. That, so in effect, what we have seen is capture of HSE by government. It is no longer in any serious sense an autonomous quasi-independent body. Um, and if you want to show that most graphically, um, we only need to turn to the appointment of the new chair. For those who don't know, the new chair is a woman called Sarah Newton. Sarah Newton was a Conservative MP um, during the period from 2010 to 2019. Um, if that was okay, yeah, that's a bit of a problem perhaps. Then we need to note that she was a minister in the Department of Work and Pensions. The, government, the department responsible for the HSE. Then we, we learned that she was actually became responsible for the health and safety unit within the Department of Work and Pensions. So we have a chair of the HSE who was a minister in the Department of Work and Pensions with responsibilities for health and safety at the exact time that the cuts Steve so eloquently outlined to HSE resources were being made. In, in other words, I mean, HSE now is a captive body. And so I think one area of reform is it raises the question of how do you ensure bodies like the HSE have a greater degree of independence and protection from government? <coughs> The second area of reform I would mention is revisiting what the general duties that are currently laid down under sections two and three of the Health and Safety Work Act. And I think they need revisiting for two reasons. Um, the one, the first is simply the growth of non-standard employment. Um, yes, section three to some extent captures that shift but not sufficiently. So there's a need to, to really reframe the duties to acknowledge the way in which the form of employment has often changed away from a contract of employment. The second reason um, we need to revisit them is a growing awareness of the way in which supply chains drive down working conditions in <coughs> smaller, less powerful suppliers. Um, now, there's scope for a debate about how to address those issues. Um, for what it's worth, I, I would point, uh, I identify two possible lines of action. The first is to do what Australia's done and impose the co core duties on the controllers of business not only impose a duty on controllers of business, but in relation to anybody doing work for those businesses, whether that be directly or indirectly. And the second area of uh, reform I would suggest is supply chain regulation, explicit supply chain regulation in certain problematic sectors like social care, garment manufacture, and food processing. Okay, third area of reform, again this almost goes without saying, enhancement of the rights of a worker voice at both the collective and individual level. Um, I could go on forever in this area, but just to mention a few things, uh, an explicit right to withdraw from dangerous situations, the power of trade unions and community groups to initiate private prosecutions, and the power of safety reps or representatives to serve note enforcement notices. In other words, to remove 
the, the exclusive right at the moment the HSE has to enforce the law. Finally, um, I would mention the final area of reform I would mention is again it comes back to general duties, and that is to start addressing the issue of psycho social harm by imposing duties on employers about how they control and organize work. Um, that how to do that um, is a challenging question, but it's very important it's done. In part for the narrow focus of health and safety at work, but also for that wider public health issue that Steve Toombs um, mentioned. Um, and here, I think any reform needs to be embedded into a wider reform of employment law. So I, I think the artificial divide between health and safety law and employment law um, needs to some extent to be removed. And I finish with this. I'm afraid I'm going to read. I'm going to read from a document. This is a, a book um, written by Michael Marmot in 2015 when he was talking about the links between work and people's health. And in the book, he talks about the, the way to improve the links between work and public health is to, to develop employment arrangements that have the following characteristics. One, freedom from coercion. Two, job security. Three, fair income. Four, job protection. Five, respect and dignity at work. Six, workplace participation. And seven, enrichment and lack of alienation. In, in other words, when we're talking about addressing current work-related harm, we need to have in mind the, the, the wider links between work and health. I'll stop there. Um, the last bit I know is very ambitious, but I think it needed to be flagged up. Anyway, thank you. Thanks very much for that, Phil. Excellent um, contribution as ever. A clear outline of what we hope to do as we progress into stage two of our project, which will be to, you know, we've we've identified the problems we need to look at. Where do we go in the future? And I think you know, the themes that you've set out and the areas for reform it hit it on the nail. That doesn't mean, of course, that we don't need more input. Um, as part of this um, committee of inquiry, we will be hoping to attract evidence and submissions from a wide range of experts, um, the HSE, the government, trade union health and safety reps, um, workers who are currently um, maybe unorganised, as you say, working in the gig economy, anybody who can highlight the nature and the problems of today's uh, modern world of work, because as you say, Robins and the law that it um, led to over 50 years old we need to review it and restate it and move forward so thanks very much for that phil um that is great now we have some more time for some questions um both to our, i mean us all our speakers are still here i believe so and um, that can be for anybody and um, there was one i missed this morning because it wasn't in the um in the appropriate box for me to pick up. Uh, and that's from Richard Alcock, who is an RMT health and safety rep. Um, he covers Waterloo, Clapham, Junkin and Feltham. Um, now his question is, they have a good relationship with uh, the employers, but he has concerns that the roadmap out of lockdown should only be an advisory and not necessarily instructive. He says he fears that once June arrives, and the UK is in a new normality. Thousands of passengers will be travelling on the rail network. Uh, workers on buses, tubes and top trains need to be seriously considered, along with other vulnerable workers, because of the potential threat of being infected by possible virus strains. What does the panel think? Um, so are we opening up 
we were too slow to shut down. Are we opening up too early? That's one question. Um, there's another from Paul McKenna, uh, who says one company that I was informed of when two workers tested positive, the company informed them to say that they were at home working, not in the workplace. Um, hard to prove. We've seen examples of that. <clears throat> I believe that was happening in other workplaces where the employer tells people to switch off their app um, because they don't want them to say that they have to self um, isolate. Um, and I'll just put in this third question before I go back to our speakers. And this again was from this morning. Can you explain more about the process of taking an injunction out against an employer? Um, now, as I said, that might be something the Institute could look at further. I don't know whether there is a short answer to that as opposed to a longer one, but there's three um, questions to start off with. Uh, I, th I think almost the, the post, I don't know, I'm buried away in Italy at the moment, so I've lost the, the language of what, what you're using over there in the UK, but um, the post whatever happens in June, when everything opens up or so, supposed to open up again, I think it's potentially very scary. Um, and I, I, people may not be aware, HSE gave evidence to uh, the Working Pension Select Committee last week. And I've not had a chance to read the transcript properly. But what I did spot with just 14 million pounds additional funding that HSE got is being rolled over, but it is still being ring fenced. In other words, there's no sign of HSE getting any new funding settlement. And so all the weaknesses we've been talking about today about regulation are going to be there. Um, so one has to be rather fearful I feel. Yeah you're just showing off Phil that you're in Italy and we're stuck here in the cold <laughs> weather um, but yeah I get you. Um, so uh, Michael or John do you want to answer the one on injunction? I'm here from John so, so I'll jump in. Um, let's assume that you've got to say an employee who doesn't provide PPE um, and then, so there's a clear risk of transmission, just to give a practical example. The, the argument will be, well, that's in breach of the common law duty. Now, you, you can't get a, an injunction in the employment tribunal. You'd have to go in the county court or more likely the high court. First thing is you've got to act very quickly because if, if the union delays, it's likely to be said, well, um, you know, why did, if you let it persist, you can't have been that bothered. So you've got to act quickly. But then effectively, you've got to overcome three questions. Um, there's a three-stage test. First of all, is there a serious issue to be tried? So for that, the union would need to show that there, there, there's good grounds for thinking. You don't have to show it conclusively that the employer is in breach of its common law duty to provide re to ensure a safe um, system or workplace. So that's step one. Step two is whether damages would be an adequate remedy. And again, the union would say no, because the risks here are of serious illness or at, at worst death. And even though those things can be compensated for damages, I don't think you'd have much difficulty persuading a court that um, a damages action after death is not a sufficient remedy, even if your family may benefit. So you'll overcome step two, forgive me being flippant. And so the step three is where the balance of convenience lies. And, and ordinarily in a case like that, I think the court would tend to the view that the balance of convenience, as it called, which looks at various factors, would um, uh, the employer would say, well, we've got to change our workplace practices, if you're right. The union would say, yeah, well, big deal. It's not going to cost you a lot. You've just got to provide suitable PPE. So provided the steps taken didn't involve something really radical like shutting down the workplace, I think the balance of convenience would often favour the employees. I mean, the, the real practical difficulties are acting quickly enough and the cost. But in principle, the, the legal arguments are reasonable if you've got a blatant breach by an employer that's not doing anything about it. Um, I don't know if John wants to add anything there. No, I, th I think that's a, that's a very good summary. Um, 
as as we were discussing earlier it's it's always been surprising since we've been advocating the uh, consideration be given to the use of injunctions in, uh, in dangerous situations at work for the last 25 years or so. It's always a bit of a surprise that um, very, very few cases have ever been brought. Um, but the, this this is a situation where, where I think it could be, depending on the facts. Yeah. Yeah. I just just say this: the the trade union obviously would need a uh, an expert uh, to uh, uh, give evidence to the court of the measures which ought to be taken, which haven't been taken, the practicability of those measures, and the costs of those measures. So this is this is definitely a case where you need expert evidence. Thanks for that, John and Michael. Um, there are a couple of more comments, questions that have been added. Uh, Mick Hilda offers one. I'd add one issue, the need for gender differences to be taken into consideration by employers. Um, and that is, there's a question on a similar theme, devastating analysis by Professor Toombs and Phil James. Thank you. This is from Jonathan. Can the panel comment on the consensus statement by HSE and Public Health England, which denies racism in the workplace and says that the grossly disproportionate deaths of black workers are due to cultural differences um, as opposed to employer activity or non-activity. Uh, and... There is one from Juliana which says, would speakers advise whether to or under what circumstances safety reps should bring in HSC against intransigent employers? Well, good luck with that one. <laughs> um, so um, I can't see hands up at the minute from our speakers. So who wants to come in on any of them? I'm... I'm I come on on the few on on the gender issue absolutely, um, you know because what what has clearly accompanied the the, the gender shift in the workforce is, is a, a new set of vulnerabilities, and work is too often designed around uh, you know the, the male body, and insufficient attention to to gender differences. So I agree with that. I'd, I'd just quickly also comment on uh, something you've not raised from the, the questions, Carolyn, about delivery drivers and uh, particularly those driving on L plates and so on. Um, and I think one of the areas that does need to be looked at is, is the links between workplace health and safety and road, road safety. And at the moment, HSC tends to step back from road safety. But you know the rise of the gig economy um, is raising major, major safety issues uh, around the people doing the delivering, uh, mm. which need to be addressed. And the other thing is, I'm I'm quite convinced that the uh, the ONS data does show that uh, black and minority ethnic, the greater vulnerability of black and minority ethnic people is tied up with the jobs they do. And in particular, yeah, so there is an occupational effect there. And if the HSE is denying that, that is truly shocking. Thanks, Phil. Uh, I'll bring in the other Phil, who's got his little blue hand up. Uh, mine's a red hand, by the way. It's not a blue one. Um, <laughs> just, just, just a few observations. I mean, first of all, just in terms of what the situation might look like in June, quite frankly, we don't know. I'm with Phil James in this. I mean, it, it's a potentially scary situation. If we think back to last year, before the lockdown, 5% of people were working at home, right? Were working from home, right? Back in the end of 2019. 42% by April, in April. The number then declined as there was a drift back to work and with the return of the schools, and then we see this, you know, the so-called second spike rise and so on. And now we're back down to, we're up back, back up to 40% and so on. Now. That just shows that the, 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 the release, if you like, or the sort of opening up leads to a rise in cases. Now, the whole thing now 
is predicated upon the success of the vaccination programme. And some of the evidence that's coming out today shows that, yeah, whilst mortality and serious illness amongst older people is falling, nevertheless, there seems to be quite a virulent trans uh, transfer amongst the young. Now, if that amongst the working active age population, particularly below the age of 50, now, if that is the case, then we don't know what new variants may appear. We don't know the, the longer term success of um, the, the vaccine program and so on. We don't know, there, there are things in there that we do not know. Therefore, the precautionary principle absolutely uh, should apply. And that means, you know, a real, really cautious, really slow and, uh, and, and, and unions being really as, as much as possible tough with employers when premature return to work takes place. The second thing I wanted to mention was something that has not been mentioned today, but it is going to be increasing. Well, actually, within that, we could, long COVID is, is really important in that respect as well. The second, and the, all sorts of issues are going to arise over that. The second issue, of course, here is, is the question of working from home. And what, what, what working from home arrangements are going to become semi-permanent and the new normal, new abnormal, or what have you. I know from the research that I did to that I've done, which was released today, and I'm quite happy to circulate this. What we're finding, what I've found on the basis of three over 3,000 responses of office workers across the UK, is that it is already leading to an intensification of work. So 32% of those who have been working from home for the last six months say there's been a rise in pace of work, volume work, intensity of work, with the mental health consequences that arise from this. So. People are prepared to put up with stuff because when they're working at home, because it's a safer environment. But going forward, you can see that employers won't let a good crisis go to waste. And you can see the intensification of work turning up. 40% have said that the mental health has deteriorated mm. since they've been working from home. So this opens up a whole new area of kind of regulation of enforcement of what the HSE's role is when the home becomes the workplace, as well as for trade union activity and so on. This is a huge area. And again, within this, I think, you know, we're only beginning to, to you know, to get a handle on it. Thanks very much for that, um, Phil. Yeah, intensification of home work and there's a whole load of issues. Whether you're going to be compulsory to have a vaccine before you can get a job is another issue that's going to open up legal questions. Steve, you've got your hand up. Yeah, thanks. Just just three really very brief points about kind of returning to, 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 to work and so on. I mean, you know, look, I don't know if people see the Independent Sage broadcast every Friday afternoon. You can catch up on it on YouTube if you don't. It's fantastic, in my opinion. Uh, last week's, or I start with data, last week's broadcast uh, started by identifying clear upturns in cases amongst school aged children, 5 to 15, not surprising, but that's, that, that's independent of the numbers of tests, that's not a testing effect. So we know that transmission is increasing in and then more likely around schools. Second thing to say is that vaccination may be very impressive, but it's not a strategy, right? It's not a way out, you know, it's part of the strategy. We still have no, there's no discussion anymore, we still have no test, trace and isolate system worth its name, despite having spewed out £37 billion to the, to the private sector. And also we don't know what vaccination does in terms of transmission, right? We still don't have any evidence about that as far as I know. And thirdly, you know, we still have uh, significant and understandable levels of vaccine hesitancy, not least amongst those kind of vulnerable groups, you know, who, who have no reason to trust authority, right? So I just add those kind of fairly obvious notes of caution uh, mm. to, to, you know, and add to the fears about opening up. Mm. Thanks, Steve. There's another issue um, <clears throat> in the question box that hasn't really been talked on, which is about shielding. Um, that special shielding ends on the 1st of April. Um, I am no the answer to this, but do the panel think that this should be reviewed at least until all people shielded and are fully vaccinated or maybe sets a later date as returning to where it could be fatal uh, for some people? Um, there's a Question. There's another question from Mick Holder. Does the panel feel our occupational exposure standard system is fit for purpose? That is all I can spot in there. There are many comments in the chat box for people to review and go over. And if I've missed any points, which I often do, Hilda Palmer is always quick in there to put the answer or the suggestion or the link to more materials in the chat box. So thank you, Hilda, for joining us and for contributing in that way. 
Um, there is a comment from um, Kate Moran who says, yes, that maternity uh, action I've shown that wholeheartedly agree with the comments on gender issues. I'll stop talking and go over to our speakers who are by far the experts. Janice, have you got anything that you would like to add? back on the disproportionate um, effect on black workers because uh, I mean it's been shown even though they've reluctantly um, uh, given out reports on it you know and there was all that fiasco where they, they weren't, weren't going to tell anybody what uh, that there was a disproportionate impact on black workers um, it, it's, it definitely has and it's you know it's it's down to dis uh, discrimination and it's down to the jobs that they were doing and the um, you know the poverty that some of them are, are living in you know, and we should be, um, it certainly isn't, should, shouldn't be hidden and, it's, and it needs to be addressed and it needs to be properly researched and, you know, and the information had acted on this time. Um, and I think I'd just say as well about um, coming out of lockdown too early and, and relying on vaccinations. It's just another mitigation, as Steve said, you know, this is just part, another part of mitigation and we don't know what the consequences, what the, what the results are going to be. Um, and I think I think it was Steve that said about young younger younger people. You know they're not being vaccinated yet, and we've got great fears that the virus is going to mutate again. It's become more deadly, more transmissible amongst younger younger people. And there's a whole host of unknown quantities in this, and we should be coming out of lockdown really really carefully. Um, should have in place all the same mitigations in place. You know for people that are vulnerable. A lot of those people will never be able to be vaccinated either, you know. Mm. So there's a, you know, there's people that are never going to get vaccination because it's not going to be able. They're not going to be able to because the health conditions to have that. So mm. we've got to be That's really nice. careful as to how we move forward. I think. Yeah. Thanks very much. Good points there, Janet. Michael, have you got your pen up? Yeah. Thank. Thanks, Kat. There, were, there was a point for Kate, who raised the issue of pregnant women being sent home and then being denied SSP. Okay, um, I did an advice for Maternity Alliance with Karen Monaghan QC, which you can find on Twitter if you go to my and if you can't find, email me and I'll send you it. It's, it's a, in publicly available. But we concluded that, that it, it would amount to pregnancy discrimination if women weren't paid full pay in those circumstances. So you can raise that. The only other thing I wanted to raise, um, Cad, was about compulsory vaccinations, which you mentioned that's going to give rise to potential discriminatory impacts as well, because not only is there evidence that um, some communities are less likely to want to have a vaccine than others, it affects women who are pregnant or who are attempting to conceive. So that, that could be another ground for um, potential discrimination challenges where employers attempt to introduce compulsory vaccination policies. Yeah, brilliant. Thanks very much for that. Um, now, I have my eye on the time as ever. I believe we have come to the end of our proposed time for this session, unless anyone's got a burning comment that they want to finish with. If not, then I um, will just say thank you very much to all of our speakers who give incredibly generously of their time, their expertise, their knowledge. They do it all for free, I should point out. Um, hey. Nobody is paid for any of this work. Well, nobody paid by the Institute anyway. You didn't tell us that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you know thank you very much we really appreciate it we couldn't be here producing this work without your assistance and your input so it is great we look forward to moving on to stage two of our project which is the committee of inquiry um, and I'm sure well I hope but I'm sure uh, all our experts will stay involved for that project thanks to everybody for coming our next slide as we leave will show you information about our next event Event, which is about a case law review uh, and accompanies our next publication, which is uh, Labour Law Highlights, our annual uh, review of statutory and judicial decisions. Um, so thank you again, everybody. Very informative. I've learned an awful lot as ever, and uh, I look forward to seeing people at our next event. So well done. See you soon. Bye.